Hello, and welcome back to Storytime with Eric Zimmer. Where we last left off in uh, Sagamore Hill, Theodore Roosevelt's summer White House by Bill Blyer, we were up to the point when Theodore Roosevelt had lost his first wife and was close to remarrying and had recently completed the construction of his house on Sagamore Hill. Now let's see what happens next. Are you ready? All right, let's begin. Ah, chapter three, a rising politician's home. When Roosevelt came back to New York to visit during his two years in the Dakotas, he stayed with Bam Me, but he imposed a special condition. He mu his sister must ensure he would not run into their childhood friend, Edith Kermit Caro. Theodore and Edith had known each other since he was three and she was an infant, as her family lived next to his grandfather in Union Square. Edith had visited the Roosevelt's at Tranquility when T.R. was 17 and she was 14. He spent hours rowing her around so they could talk about wildlife and books. Theodore appreciated that Edith was almost as widely read as he was. For some unknown reason, Theodore and Edith had ended their friendship, but she remained close to other members of the family and even attended Theodore and Alice's 1880 wedding. Four years later, despite T.R.'s precautions, he and Edith countered each encountered each other at Bammy's. They rekindled their fondness for each other and became engaged on November 17, 1885. The couple told no one as it had been less than two years since Alice's death, and they feared the reaction of family and friends. The following summer, Roosevelt left his Badland ranches to accept the Republican nomination to run for mayor of New York City, even though he knew he had no chance of winning in the Democratic stronghold. After being crushed at the polls, he sailed for England and married Edith in London on December 2, 1886. The couple honeymooned for 15 weeks in England and on the continent. In Florence, Italy, they bought furniture for the dining room at Sagamore Hill before learning that the worst winter in the Dakotas in half a century had wiped out most of T.R.'s cattle herd and one-third of his inheritance. Roosevelt agonized that his losses could prevent him from living at Sagamore Hill. He wrote to Bammy from Florence, My financial affairs for the past year make such a bad showing that I think very seriously of closing Sagamore Hill and going to the ranch for a year or two. I must live within my income and begin paying off my debt this year, and no, at no matter what costs, even to the shutting up or renting of Sagamore Hill. Bitterly as I should hate such an alternative. Theodore added in a letter three days later, I do love Sagamore Hill. I will not give it up if I can help. Edith was pregnant. The couple ruled out staying in the Dakotas and agreed to move into Sagamore Hill and live on a tight budget. Theodore and Edith returned to New York on March 27, 1887. At Bammy's house, they reunited with three-year-old Alice, who greeted them with a bunch of pink roses. How nice. While his daughter went to visit her grandparents in Massachusetts, T.R., who had been away from Sagamore Hill for five months, and Edith relocated to the home for his first w built for his first wife and decorated by his sister. The new Mrs. Roosevelt had been in the house only once previously, a year and a half earlier when Bammy had hosted a hunt ball several weeks before T.R. and Edith's engagement. The couple would share Sagamore Hill for 32 years, and Edith would live there another 29 on her own. Now this is where it really begins. The ever-dignified Edith was likely not pleased by the animal head staring down from the walls and skins and carpeting the floor was when she stepped out of the carriage, but she accepted that the taxidermy came with her husband. T.R.'s second wife made herself at home by installing old Caro family furniture along with the couple's acquisitions from Italy, and she staked out the white-walled parlor as her personal, dom personal domain. It featured softer colors, French tapestries, elegant rugs, Sevres porcelain, a pale floral sofa, and other furniture, including a small writing desk inherited from her aunt. 
She did admit some animal trophies into the room. A polar bearskin presented to her by Rear Admiral Robert E. Peary after his 1909 expedition in which he claimed to have reached the North Pole on lion skins that were gifts from her husband. T.R. chose the library across the hall as his personal space, where he could write under the gaze of a portrait of his father. The Roosevelt selected a second floor bedroom, facing the north and west as their bedroom, even though it proved to be cold and drafty, especially in the winter. When the, T when the Roosevelts moved in, T.R. was almost 29 and without full-time employment. He was temporarily out of politics and government. Writing was his best option, as he was the successful author of The Naval War of 1812, published in 1882. Despite T.R.'s love of company, the couple entertained little to save money while Theodore worked on a biography of founding father, Gouverneur Morris. Over the next decade, T.R. would re-enter public service and continue writing, but his income was never large. His pe he periodically ruminated about being forced to sell Sagamore Hill. Luckily, that never happened. Because, oh. The family quickly settled into a routine. T.R. would carry Alice down the, to breakfast piggyback every morning and build wood block houses with her. For the rest of the morning, T.R. would write, while Edith managed the household, sewed and handled correspondence. Edith also handled the farm books and paid the bills. She was a lot more careful with money than Theodore. Actually, had it not been for Edith, Theodore would have had to have sold Sagamore Hill. <laughs> after lunch, they would walk in the woods, swim, ride, or go boating. Shortly after Theodore completed his biography of Gouverneur Morris, Edith went into early labor on September 12, 1887, before the nurse hired to help with the delivery arrived. Dr. J. West Roosevelt was summoned from his nearby home to deliver Theodore III at 2.15 a.m. the next morning on September 13, 1887. Alice welcomed her baby brother enthusiastically, practically living in a rocking chair next to his crib. Now, I know history remembers him usually as Theodore Jr., but technically he was actually Theodore III, as President Roosevelt's father was also named Theodore even though President Roosevelt didn't commonly use a junior suffix for some reason. Anyways. After spending the winter in New York, in April 1888, the Roosevelts moved back to Cove Neck. T.R. worked on his four-volume, The Winning of the West. Edith, who preferred a relatively isolated life with her immediate family, and to be alone with her books yielded somewhat to her husband's gregarious nature and thirst for interaction with all types of people. She even reluctantly took up tennis, an activity in which her predecessor was proficient. Playing the sport at Sagamore Hill was not for her for the finicky. The dirt court featured holes dug by moles, and it was covered with moss because it was so shaded by the low branches of trees which interfered with play. If a ball hit one, the point was played over. The resident chipmunk that insisted on running course across the court during games was another hazard. In May 1889, President Benjamin Harrison appointed T.R. to the Civil Service Commission, a position he would hold for six years. Edith was pregnant again, and her husband was in Washington on October 10, 1889, when he received a telegram from Sagamore Hill that Edith had given birth prematurely to another son. Kermit. Uh, yeah. Roosevelt rushed for home but missed the last train to Oyster Bay. He chartered a special locomotive which got him to Cove Neck at about 4 a.m. Alice got, gained a sister when Ethel Carol Roosevelt arrived on August 13, 1891. The financial panic of 1893 left the Roosevelts again short on cash prompting renewed discussion about giving up Sagamore Hill, or at least having the rest of the family live there year-round instead of in Washington while T.R. continued to work in the capital. Roosevelt threaded that if his income ran behind expenses again in 1894, he would have to sell the Kovnik property. 
Edith wrote to her sister, Emily, that she had begun making her own tooth powder to reduce spending. T.R. staved off selling Sagamore Hill by instead selling a field to his uncle James to get bread and butter for the bunnies, as Edith put it. For some reason, they called their children bunnies. Don't ask me why. I have no idea. Despite their financial strain, the Roosevelts had another bunny to feed when on April 9th, 1894, Edith gave birth in Washington, D.C. to Archibald Bullock Roosevelt. He was baptized in the parlor of Sagamore Hill two months later. Roosevelt left Washington in 1895 for a two-year stint as a, a president of the New York City Police Board. While T.R. was rooting out corruption, he stayed many nights at Bammy's house, but when he traveled back and forth between Manhattan and Oyster Bay, he pedaled a bicycle to the station as one of the first commuters from what would have would become a bedroom suburb. Roosevelt again found himself split between living in Washington and Oyster Bay when President William McKinley appointed him, assist, appointed him Assistant Secretary of the Navy in 1897. Edith and Theodore's last child, Quentin, was delivered on November 19, 1897, in the capital. All the children survived to adulthood, despite broken bones and cuts with ensuing infections, not unusual in a hyperactive household. <laughs> as well as cases of typhoid and scarlet fever, pneumonia, and appendicitis. Jesus. After a year promoting both readiness of, for the Navy and war with Spain over its treatment of Cuba, Roosevelt resigned his assistant secretary post on May 6, 1898, to help form and serve as lieutenant colonel of the 1st U.S. Volunteer Cavalry, the famous Rough Riders during the Spanish-American War. When Colonel Leonard Wood was promoted, T.R. assumed command in Cuba and led the large, the charge up Kettle Hill and then San Juan Hill, which made him famous. He returned to Long Island with the regiment to be quarantined before being mustered out in September 1898. When the colonel, as he ever after liked to be called, returned to Oyster Bay on leave before the Rough Riders disbanded, he was welcomed by a crowd of 1,500 and a brass band. At Sagamore Hill, he was greeted by a painted cardboard banner made by the children and tempered by Edith's restraint, in honor of Colonel Roosevelt's return. A constant parade of newspapermen, politicians, and other visitors came to the house to sound out its war hero owner about it, his political intentions. The idea of Roosevelt running for governor of New York was widely circulated. The house's besieged